Chapter Nine: The Western War, the Thirty Years' War, sixteen eighteen to sixteen forty eight. While Sultan Murad was battling his way across the Middle East, claiming land for the Ottoman Turks, Europe was fighting its own war with itself. This European war started when a handful of unhappy Germans threw two German noblemen out of a window. Thirty years later, soldiers from every European nation lay dead across hundreds of battlefields. The story of this Thirty Years' War begins all the way back with Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. We heard about Charles in the very first chapter of this book. Charles divided his empire between his brother Ferdinand and his son Philip II. Philip II inherited Spain and the Netherlands, although William the Silent then helped the Netherlands break free. Ferdinand got Charles's German lands and eventually became Holy Roman Emperor in his brother's place. When Ferdinand died, he left his German lands to his son Maximilian, who then passed them on to his son Matthias. When Matthias died without children, those German lands went to his cousin Ferdinand II. At once, trouble began. In those days, Germany was a collection of small territories, each ruled by a powerful prince who owed allegiance to the German king. Each prince had the right to say whether his small territory would be Catholic or Protestant. Many of the German princes and their territories were Protestants, but like his great great uncle Charles V, Ferdinand II was a devout Catholic. He hated Protestantism and at once began passing laws to stamp out Protestant worship in his new kingdom. The Protestant princes in one particular part of Germany, called Bohemia, were furious. So were their Protestant subjects. They gathered together in the Bohemian city of Prague, ready to protest Ferdinand's Catholic laws. But Ferdinand wasn't even in Germany. He had gone traveling and left two of his officials in charge of his kingdom while he was gone. The two officials didn't know what to do with this huge, angry crowd of Protestants. First, they tried to reason with the crowd. Then they nervously ordered the crowd to disperse. No, the mob shouted. And then one of the leaders suggested, "Let's kill these two and form a new Protestant government here and now." At that, the two officials beat a quick retreat. They ran to the royal castle of Prague and locked themselves in. The mob followed them, broke through the gates, and overran the castle's halls and chambers. Finally, they found the two officials hiding in an upper room, fifty feet above the castle's courtyard. The officials pushed a huge wooden table between themselves and the crowd. But it was no use. The rioters overturned the table, grabbed the two, and threw them out of the nearest window. The two officials weren't even injured. They got to their feet and ran away. Catholics loyal to Ferdinand later said the Virgin Mary protected them. The German Protestants remarked, "No wonder they landed on a nice soft manure heap." This event was the beginning of over thirty years of fighting. Later, it became known as the Defenestration of Prague. Fenestra is the Latin word for window, so defenestration is a fancy way to say throwing someone out of a window. The rebellious Protestants now declared themselves free from Ferdinand's rule. Perhaps they didn't think Ferdinand would fight back. Many Germans didn't take Ferdinand very seriously. He was a stout little man, red-haired and blue-eyed, cheerful and short-sighted. He bustled around his palace, looking more like a servant than a king. He gave money to the poor, went to church daily. And spent his free time hunting, but Ferdinand was not as harmless as he looked. He was determined that Germany would remain Catholic. Ferdinand also had great ambitions. He was king of Germany, but he intended to become Holy Roman Emperor as well. And over the last century or so, a tradition had evolved. In order to become Holy Roman Emperor, a king had to convince seven German princes to elect him to the position in a special meeting called a Diet. Three of those princes, or electors, were Protestants and part of the rebellion. To get the title Holy Roman Emperor, Ferdinand had to get his Protestant territories and their princes back under his control. So he convinced his allies in Austria and Spain to assemble two huge armies of tough, experienced soldiers. These armies marched into Bohemia, faced the rebels, and defeated them almost immediately. Ferdinand returned to Bohemia, hanged the leaders of the mob, and stuck their heads on the railings of Prague's largest bridge. Then he took away all the land that belonged to Protestant rebels and gave it to his faithful Catholic subjects. Finally, he forced the electors to make him Holy Roman Emperor. But instead of crushing the rebellion, 
Ferdinand's actions produced more unrest. Other Protestant princes in the north of Germany hadn't been part of the rebellion, but they certainly didn't like seeing Protestant lands given away to Catholics. Would their territories disappear next? And the Protestant kings of England, the Netherlands, and Denmark, north of the Netherlands, were just as unhappy. When they looked over to Germany, they saw a Holy Roman Emperor who had just joined together with two other countries to wipe out Protestants. What if this three-country alliance decided to attack England or Denmark next? So the King of Denmark, Christian IV, gathered up his army of 30,000 soldiers and began his march into Germany, intending to put an end to Ferdinand's growing power. Christian IV was a skilled general and a smart man. He and the King of England, James I, used to write letters back and forth in Latin. He was filled with energy. According to popular rumor, he only stopped drinking to exercise and only stopped exercising to drink some more. And although he wanted to defend Protestantism, he also hoped to claim some German land for himself. As Christian IV advanced, his army grew larger. James I sent English soldiers to join his forces, and German Protestants came also to march with a Protestant Danish king. Faced with this huge army advancing across his kingdom toward his capital city, Ferdinand hired a new general, Albert of Wallenstein. Wallenstein loved war. He was very tall and skeletally thin, usually dressed in sinister black with a single streak of red. He is unmerciful, wrote the astronomer Johannes Kepler, describing Wallenstein. Devoted only to himself and his desires, covetous, deceitful, usually silent, often violent. Wallenstein even frightened Ferdinand. So when Wallenstein took command of Ferdinand's forces and met Christian IV's army full on, the Danish, English, and Protestant German soldiers were crushed. The soldiers were scattered. Christian IV himself was forced to flee for his life. Ferdinand's army marched right into Denmark and took it over. The Protestant king of Sweden, Gustavus II, watched in horror. Sweden lies just across a narrow sea from Denmark. Now the armies of the Holy Roman Emperor were camped right on the borders of his own country. Next, Ferdinand might decide to invade his land, take his throne, and force his people to become Catholics. He met together with his advisors and noblemen. All agreed that it would be wiser to attack Ferdinand's army before Wallenstein decided to turn and attack Sweden. It is better, the Swedish nobleman announced, that we tether our horses to the enemy's fence than he to ours. So the Swedish army gathered itself for war. Gustavus was better prepared than Christian IV had been. He trained his soldiers carefully, and he paid them well so that they would remain loyal. He outfitted them in the best and warmest clothes, fur cloaks, gloves, and waterproof leather boots. He taught them to fight in small groups, which could move quickly and attack the enemy from any side, rather than marching in one long, massive line, as most other armies did. And he was the first European commander to put all of his soldiers in the same uniform. Even when scattered across a battlefield, the Swedish soldiers could recognize each other by their bright blue and yellow coats. Gustavus himself, a huge yellow-haired man, broad-shouldered and strong, led his soldiers into battle. The Swedish army drove Ferdinand's men back out of Denmark and away from the coast, back toward Germany. Thousands of German soldiers were killed. Soon, Gustavus was marching into Germany itself with Ferdinand's army in retreat ahead of him. Once in Germany, Gustavus convinced the Protestant princes to join with him against Ferdinand. Together, the Swedes and Germans formed a Protestant union and stormed into the heart of Germany, headed towards Ferdinand's capital city of Vienna. Victory seemed certain, but Ferdinand wasn't ready to give up. He ordered Albert of Wallenstein assassinated and reorganized his army under another general. And as the Protestant Union advanced, Gustavus himself was killed in battle. Without his leadership, the Protestant Union began to fall apart. The Swedish soldiers became disorganized. One by one, the German Protestants began to approach Ferdinand, willing to discuss peace. The war had been dragging on for 16 years, and they were ready to stop fighting. Slowly, Ferdinand made peace with his enemies. A year later, the, the German, prin, German prince had signed a treaty that said every Protestant prince could decide what religion his territory would follow. 
the very same agreement that had been in place before the war even started. Seventeen years of fighting had accomplished nothing at all. Thousands of Germans had died of wounds or disease. Many of those who lived had no homes. Three quarters of the villages in Bohemia had been destroyed. Ferdinand ruled a ruined land, and the war wasn't over yet. The ambitious prime minister of France, Cardinal Richelieu, saw that Ferdinand had been weakened by the war. He wanted the title Holy Roman Emperor to belong to the King of France, not the King of Germany. Just weeks after the new treaty was signed, France declared war on Ferdinand. The fighting continued. Spain, Sweden, and the Netherlands joined back in. As battle followed battle, more Germans died. In some places, half the population was killed. The countryside was littered with unburied bodies. Soldiers roamed through the country, searching for food and robbing the starving populace. The poor began to eat grass in a desperate attempt to survive. But then Ferdinand, aging and weary with battle, became ill and died shortly afterward. The Germans fought on until Cardinal Richelieu also died. With both the Holy Roman Emperor and the Minister of France dead, the other countries of Europe began, cautiously, to try to arrange a peace. But it took four years for peace to be arranged. Many of the leaders involved weren't even sure what they were fighting about anymore. Finally, thirty years after the defenestration of Prague, the countries of Europe agreed to sign the Peace of Westphalia. This treaty gave some German land to Sweden and some and France. The other German territories were allowed to govern themselves. The Kingdom of Germany was so splintered that it no longer existed. Even after the Peace of Westphalia, France and Spain went on fighting with each other for eleven more years. The Thirty Years' War didn't actually end until the year 1659, 41 years after it began.